Bonjour. <laughs> yeah, this will be international. Welcome to another episode of Moments with Marley. So I started off with French because I think French is like it's the language of love. Today we're going to be talking about love, the love of God. Continuing with the series, this thing called grace. And we're talking about love because I think that the love of God and the grace of God, it's almost the same thing. Like they're in tandem. Like you can't have one without the other. They're sort of like you embrace the grace of God, you embrace his love. So that's, I guess, why I started with French. <laughs> um, yeah, quick one vulnerable moment i really don't want to be shooting right now it's 10 p.m is it 10 22 is what 10 yes 10 p.m <laughs> 10 20 as i shoot i totally didn't create enough time during the week to shoot and now it's thursday night and the video needs to be up tomorrow you're watching it today but like yeah the video needs to be up the next day so i'm sort of like you gotta do it or you gotta do it this year i'm really pushing myself to be consistent in all the different things i've set out to do so it's one of those things where it's like you don't feel like it but you do it anyway so here we are i think i'll have time tomorrow to actually pre-shoot a number of videos ahead of time so that i don't get myself caught up in this conundrum again but yeah i just got home came put together the things that i'm going to say sat down here i am so we're going to begin all right, so this thing called grace. I think, I hope, I pray that it will be <laughs> a short video. I feel like I say that every week, but let's see how it goes. <laughs> so I have one scripture that I prepared for today. Let's see how that goes. We might stick to the one scripture, we might go to a few others, but generally one great thing in mind. So I'm thinking of, we're calling this love versus the letter. The letter is maybe the law the yeah love versus the law maybe and um i think so many of us i grew up in a very religious background and i think many of us have grown up in maybe knowing god knowing jesus but in a very religious you know setting so you know that there are things that you must do you have to do this thing and this thing and this thing you know these are the this is the way you must behave in church you have to be put together don't smile too much be serious focus then these are the things you must do you don't tell lies god could strike you with lightning then if you do this and you do the other like to just be very put together in a certain way because like so that's what we know about religion and i find that for many of us that actually could be the very thing that drew us away from religion because as you start to go older you start to have questions about life you start to want to explore many things to do different things and all of that and so questions pop up in your mind about all these lists these rules and things that you have to follow but also sometimes it's just it gets exhausting following the so many rules so you find yourself with or without trying <laughs> sort of veering off on another path and i know for me one of my things was um a long time ago maybe not so long but fairly long i used to say i remember and to tell people and to tell myself that i didn't want to get born again i didn't want to give my life to jesus or to serve him or to anything until much later in my life because i wanted to have fun first because sometimes the picture that for me what the picture that other people had painted of what relationship with jesus looks like or being born again looks like is that you're gloomy you don't have fun and it's that thing of rules religion you're following you know a certain specific set of rules so you sort of pre-think about the rules and you're like this i won't handle that one i won't handle this one huh so you kind of stay away from it so that you just don't get yourself in trouble you're like let's not get ourselves into this commitment because i know that i can't commit fully um then i knew they dress badly you have to wear things that cover yourself completely you cover your arms all the way you cover yourself down to your feet you and then the clothes have to be maybe a bit baggy you can't have anything too tight fitting why are you showing anyone anything about yourself you can't yeah and your hair also has to be done a certain way 
can't have like color in your hair and you know things like that so that kept me on the outside because i was just like i genuinely i'm not willing to comply to things like this so i'm not even going to get myself started let me stay on the outside let me have my fun enjoy myself be here me and god shall sort ourselves out a little later <laughs> Thank God for the grace of God. <laughs> he found me along the way in the midst of all that. And here we are. And I'm serving God, committed to serving him, joyful as I do it. It's not a gloomy experience or something Yeah, that I do begrudgingly. It's not a dreadful thing. It actually genuinely is fun. Church for me is like the funnest place to be. Like I genuinely look forward to Sundays the whole time because I'm just like, I love it here. It's so good. As you can see, I'm dressing very modestly, but it's not, that doesn't necessarily mean you cover your neck and then you like don't show any skin, maybe your hands, that's about it, guys. Besides that, nothing, right? So it's that there was a misconception about what being in Jesus was like, and that misconception is what kept me away. So what I'm hoping to deal with today is those misconceptions, in case you have them where you're thinking about you would want to serve Jesus, so you are curious to know what that would be like. But you're thinking of all the many things there are to do, and you're like, you know what? Let me just be happy. Let me live my life the way it is. Let, let God be there. Let me be here. We don't disturb each other. We'll be happy. We shall meet in heaven somewhere, somehow. <laughs> so we're just going to sort of talk through that a little bit. I'll share with you one or two stories and some scripture. And I'll be out of here. <laughs> so, the scripture that I want to share, the thing I'm talking about today, basically, is that the thing that is going to change your life is the love of God. Knowing, receiving, and believing the love of God. Maybe knowing, believing, and receiving. First you believe it, then you receive it. Yeah. So to know that God loves you unconditionally, no matter what, to believe it so you first become aware of the fact that actually this is true true knowledge so you're aware of the fact then you believe it you say actually you know what it's talking about me i believe it it's available to me this is a thing god is talking to me 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 personally i believe it and then you receive his love right you open your heart to it you start to act like you are a loved person by god and you know all of that so the love of god and when you embrace the love of God, your life will change for the better. You'll find that all these things that we're trying to do, you, you, you become a better person by embracing the love of God. And but much, much better than when you try to follow a set of rules to become a better person. Your betterness is going to come much better, much quicker, much easier when you embrace the love of God. There's this book I read last month called Effortless Change by Andrew Womack. He may know. It's a really good book. And it talks about how you receive the word of God, meditate on it, have it, keep it in your heart and all of that. And the more you start to embrace the love of God and his, and his word and all of that, the more you start to see change in your life. But the change is effortless. You're not putting any effort towards the specific thing that needs to be changed. The effort is going towards improving your relationship with god spending more time with him knowing his word understanding who he is getting into prayer all of that and the more you do that the more you start to find that your life is changed i've shared here before about how my life for a long time was going out partying and i do it every single day right um yeah every day except sunday and then I discovered, well, I was invited to worship harvest. And so I found a place to worship. And I was like, I like this place. And so the more I started attending church and listening to the word of God, just sitting under the word of God and all of that, the more my desire started to change. I never, like God did it without my permission. I was like, I, I didn't even tell you I was ready. <laughs> but I just remember over time, people would ask me and start to invite me out for night things. Because as in, yeah, we've been doing it since you know adam for a long time so they're doing what they used to and they would start to invite me and all of a sudden they're inviting me and i'm just thinking it's so burdensome i don't want to do it you know what's going on i was still at uni at the time that i joined and i would be with friends we'd be hanging out and my friends would be drinking 
and I'd be shouting and making noise with them and I'm not indulging, right? And I had, we were doing all these things together before, remember? And then suddenly I just, I stopped. I didn't announce to anyone that I'm going to try and stop. I didn't announce to myself. I just found myself suddenly no longer interested. So I'm getting ahead of myself. I have a story in line with that and about how the grace of God really is the thing that will bring the change from the inside effortlessly with joy and all of that. Let, let's get into the scriptures first. Then I'll tell you the story. Then maybe I'll tell you another story. Then we'll be good. <laughs> um, Romans 7. 7. Um, so from 7 to 12, right? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. So the thing that I want to sort of highlight before we get into the scriptures is that the point that Paul is making is that the law is the thing that brings awareness of sin. It's like the more you try to follow it, it's like the more sinful you become. Like, have you ever seen that thing? <laughs> Dexter's Lab is what has just come to my mind. That's interesting. I don't know if you know the cartoon, Dexter's Lab. Um, it's yeah, an old cartoon from Cartoon Network a long time ago. Dexter was a little science boy who had a science lab in his room or in the basement or something in the house. And he had a sister who was very inquisitive and very cheeky. And so every time there would be a button and Dexter would say, Didi, don't touch that button. It's like, oh, would you tell her don't touch that button? She's like, okay, touch. And then she touches and then things go awry, right? It's so it's, it's like somehow when someone brings a thing to your attention, suddenly you're more aware of it. And you, 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 it's, it, it's like you've empowered the thing somehow. Like you see a signpost on the ground saying caution wet floor and suddenly you're like, oh, okay, is it really wet? I want to see. Or, you know, it says wet paint, do not touch. Then suddenly you have the urge to touch it and see like how wet is wet, you know, like just because it says do not touch. So it's that the law brings awareness <laughs> of the sin. So it in a way empowers the sin because the more you're focusing on the sin, trying to beat it, the more it, it, it has power over you. The more you're empowering it by focusing on the thing, what you focus on grows, right? So let's continue with that. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. So yeah, like he was living his life, life was good, what, 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 all of a sudden, in comes a law that says you shall not covet suddenly you're like what does covet mean what is that about and then all of a sudden you find yourself admiring everyone's thing with envy uh, looking around like just yeah the awareness has come and now the sin has been introduced because of the law verse 8 but sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire that's what sin produced right but it took, it took opportunity by the commandment, the law that was given. For apart from the law, sin was dead. So where the law was not, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment just and good. Okay, so, yeah, here he says in verse 9, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. He doesn't mean died like dying and going to heaven, but death in terms of just experiencing death in whatever area of your life that it may be. And that's really what happens when the law comes in and you try to focus on that so much. You'll find that there'll be death in some area, maybe death to your joy. You're doing things, but you're sort of doing them. It's labored. They, you're not experiencing that joy of serving God. Guys, if you're serving God and there's no joy, you, you still need to embrace his grace because it's he's a good God. He's a loving father and there's so much joy in serving him. So it means there's something that you still need to unlock if you're not experiencing that because it's not supposed to be a burden some experience and you shouldn't do it just because you want to impress god you want god to be happy with you god like that one is settled he loves you he 
he's impressed by you he thinks you're amazing for as long as you're in jesus so it's settled so you serve him as a response to that because you're like man you've been so good to me in fact i want to tell the world about you and then you know you serve him and just tell everyone about jesus but it's not that you're doing it that he may be impressed the impression is there it's made and it's a good one right okay so there's one particular scripture but yeah but anyway so the point of this is that the law brings an awareness of sin so that's the thing that introduces death it's the thing that introduces commotion the thing that just makes the thing i don't know man so focusing on the law so when you focus on the love of god then his love enters your heart then he can do a work in you and then the things start to get changed you see when i was in high school i had a friend i had a best friend called shayla i don't know if she watches this but hi just in case one day you see this somewhere greetings to you and she was from tanzania and we used to spend a lot of time together i was in boarding school so we would we were friends just spend time together and she had a number of there were quite a number of tanzanian girls at the school so she had a number of friends like those ones as well but she also hung out with us a lot i found that after a while of hanging out with her i started to speak like her my expressions looked like hers i started to speak swahili a lot more i pick up languages very quickly i'm interested in learning languages and i yeah right so i think i open myself so we talk I'd be like hey jamani what are you then we laugh then whatever like we really would talk together it wasn't like deep deep fluent stuff but we would speak a little bit then i also went through a phase where i learned kinyaranda at school because i had very many rwandan friends and i was intrigued by their language and i'm like let's learn it what's the point of that that the more you spend time with someone the more you start to look like them you sound like them you speak like them there's just something about the way you behave that can be pointed back to the person or the people you're hanging with so it's that the more you spend time with god you just embrace his love and so you do everything out of that place of knowing you're loved and the more you spend time with god the more you start to look like him to speak like him and all of that so if you you find that that you find so god is not like some drunk guy walking around with no purpose in life not knowing what to do so if that was the experience that you had the more you get into god the more you start to look like god instead and all these other things are stripped away it's an effortless thing nobody's asking you to do it no one is pointing fingers it just happens you find that because god is love you start to become a person of love that you respond differently to situations you're graceful towards others you're not angry because love does not anger it's, it's not easily angered love is kind love is patient so all those things describe god and so you find you used to be the person that would short circuit over any small thing and now you have so much patience to deal with people and you don't get angry easily and you're like when did god consult me to deal with this matter at which point did it happen but it's just you spend time with him so when you understand that you're loved nothing gets in the way nothing you don't allow anything to separate your relationship with god you're not scared to approach him you're not fearful about getting close to him because you know that you loved you're like ah yeah yesterday i did a thing i messed up i told a lie it's so bad but ah, God still loves me and you go to God and you approach him and you smile so your relationship is constant and consistent and so the more you're in that relationship the more you're being changed so I'll tell you a quick story um in my days of going out I lived with my grandmother and I would go out she knew she had lived with so many teenagers over so many years and seen some of these things from some of them so it wasn't like a shocking thing but i think maybe mine was like the most outrageous i don't know <laughs> but so i used to go out like i said every day apart from sunday sunday i'd stay home and rest and so i'd go out and i'd come home at very strange hours 2 in the morning 3 in the morning 4 in the morning and the thing is i'd leave home usually by like 4 i've left because the place we'd go hang out it was a very specific place like it was the same place all the time my friends and i it would only change on the weekend at the weekend we go bar hopping different places but it was one standard place during the week and they would open at 5 5 30 so i'd usually leave home also around 4 4 30 so that you find it when it's opening you enter and you see it you hang out you start with soda you drink you hang out you talk and the moment it gets dark like this 
then you start now adding the bitter drinks <laughs> and then people start coming and all of that so we do that and then usually you just go home when the night now starts to get dry or you get tired or the person with the ride is like i'm leaving i'm dropping you home now if you're going or there's just no one around you anymore so i get home 2 a.m 3 a.m whatever time and call my grandmother <laughs> pick me up with no shame not to pick me up open the door for me the front door when i get home with no shame um i can tell you on good record that my grandmother was not like pleased <laughs> with my going out she was not like oh my god this beloved granddaughter of mine in whom i'm well pleased like yeah i guess she still loved me but it's not like she was not excited about the idea of me going out or that kind of thing but I find it interesting that she never addressed it to me once. We had conversations. There was a time before then when I had jumped. I used to like escape. And she told me never to do it. She said just not to, it shouldn't happen because she knew someone. The son left, escaped in the middle of the night, took the car, had an accident. The parents the, they were, the parents were called in the morning to pick him up from the morgue. Someone they left sleeping in their bed. She told me never do it. Ask for permission and I'll give it to you. So I started asking for permission, asking for permission. Then eventually I stopped asking for permission. I just go and come back whenever. So bad. Anyhow, so she would ask for, I mean, I'd call her in the morning, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., my strange hours. And she would come, open the door for me, go back to sleep. Then I also go to sleep. Now, the thing that I know, and I think she said it to me a few times, that eh, I really pray for you and I cover you. So what my grandmother did and how she responded to that situation was she would just go and pray for me, but she didn't address it to me. And what that did is it, you know, when a person is doing a thing and it's not a good thing, they are aware of the fact that they're doing the thing. Does that make sense? So if you keep hounding them over it, you're not helping the situation. You're not making it any better. In fact, you're drawing them away from you because suddenly you start to become like this enemy that makes them feel bad about themselves. They're already dealing with that thing. So her not addressing it a certain way to me directly and to my face was her showing me grace. That she's just putting forward the face of love. She's treating me like love is the thing that comes first. We're not going to focus on this thing. We're not going to make it become an issue between us. We are not like, let's just be happy and be as if it's not there. Like between you and me, we are good. I love you. I see no fault in you. Like life is good. So what what that did for me is that I, there was never a point in my mind where I saw her as an enemy or I saw her as someone I should be afraid of or I should hide things from. So like she knew all my habits because it's not, I wasn't doing like many, many bad things. I was just, it was really alcohol, party with my friends and all that. Um, but so like she knew so it makes it easier even for her because then she knows what to pray for because I, I keep coming home at the same time. She's like, Father, Lord, it wasn't 2 a.m. Today it was 4 a.m. Lord, your children. <laughs> but there was there, there was no separation between the two of us, if that makes sense. And so over time, our, our relationship was never strained. And then over time, the changes started to happen where... I wasn't doing it as much anymore. And so the change started to happen without there ever having to be friction between us, if that makes sense, right? As opposed to situations where you have someone breathing down your neck the whole time, fighting, shouting, telling you how you're a failure. I've seen situations like that. And what ends up happening is that people start to withdraw because you know you're going to go home. Your parent is going to say this bad thing about you, your grandparent, your sibling. What's wrong with you? You're such a failure. Why can't you do like this? Why can't you? You start to withdraw and feel like you and this person, there's no connection. So you find you're spending even longer hours because you're like, ah, let me wait for 7 a.m. My grandmother will be awake. Then I'll go home. Then I'll sleep. Because you're trying to minim minimalize the contact as much as possible because the contact is not a nice contact. So it's that the love is the thing that brings forth a good fruit, not the pinpointing and focusing too much on the law. I'll tell you another story. There was, I don't know if I can share it, but I think I can. I, I have a sister, a little sister, and she once upon a time used to smoke weed. And so 
I remember she was with some friends of mine. Um, one time she had come to visit me at uni, we were hanging out, and then she disappeared with some of my friends. I was like, where do these guys keep going, right? Because I didn't get into smoking weed. What? I, I fear. I fear. I was like, mm -hmm. So I was like, where do these guys keep disappearing to? Until it dawned on me that they would go to smoke weed. And I was so annoyed because I'm like, how can these friends of mine take my younger sister? Are you guys mad? And I was truthfully so annoyed. Then they came back and I'd smile at like, mm, welcome back guys. Mm -hmm. Where are you coming from? This also I mentioned was at the time when I had now stopped drinking, the partying as much, what it had mostly gone down. It was still there a little bit, but really I had now become more immersed in the church. So I was upset, like really, really, really actually very angry that my friends would do something like that. I'm like, this is someone's little sister, like what are you doing? You can't do that. Then they'd come back and I'd smile. And it's not that I was being hypocritical. It's that I was aware because I had come from that kind of background. I knew how I reacted to people that kept making me feel like a sinner and a bad person. And how I reacted to like my grandmother, for instance, who didn't make me feel like there was something wrong with me. And I was like, I can't push her away. So I would smile. I'm like, hey, uh -huh, welcome back. Where are you from? What? Then we keep it moving. But in my heart, I was not okay. But I would pray. And then the thing about that, that it did for me, the realization that I had was that if I remain in this position, I will always know what's going on in her life. So I know how to help her, how to pray, what to pray for, as opposed to if I push her away where she's doesn't and I don't even know anything that's going on in her life. So I had to embrace it, smile, be as if, you know, like we're still sisters. We still talk about other things. We just do our things and whatever. And that issue, I never, ever addressed it even once. Today, she's serving in the church that she belongs to. She doesn't do any of that stuff anymore. Like it's just, it turned around completely. And I give thanks to God for that. But it's that if I had started to attack her for it and make her feel bad and pinpoint the thing and talk about it, I would just create a separation and then the thing would not really, that doesn't help or empower someone to let go of that situation. So it's the same thing like that between you and God, between me and God, between us and God, is that he's not there pinpointing things. You did this, you did this. Even this thing, I told you to do it, you didn't do it. This one, I told you not to do it, you did it. Even like he's not doing that because that, it doesn't produce good results yeah the thing that produces something good is love love is what produces something good and love is the thing that we should bank on and hold on to if we want to see the fruits of love in our life you root yourself in love and then the fruit that comes out is love i feel like that was deep <laughs> yeah but so anyway today's teaching was really just about knowing the grace of god and the love of god embracing it so knowing that you are loved receiving his love, believing his love and receiving his love. Because when you focus on his love, good things come out of it for you. The fruit of it is love. You become a person of love. You do things of love. You find that you are, your habits are much better. You've dropped the weird habits. You've picked up better habits. You become joyful. You become, I dealt with depression for a while and I was suicidal once upon a time. Like once, it wasn't an often recurring thing, but I had a season where I was like, I actually just need to go because I'm tired. And I can't remember the last time I even thought about something like that. And it's not that I don't have issues anymore, but it's like, like in the face of my good, this guy who loves me, he's going to do so much for me, he's going to turn it around, things will be better. Like suddenly you're not phased by things as much. Like the big things, the little things, whatever it is, you're just, you're happy. And it's available to you. So I just wanted to share that today and to say embrace the love of God because it's the thing that will change your life. It's the thing that will bring effortless change for you, make you better, happier, more joyful. So don't focus on rules and religion and things that you must do and mustn't do. Focus on God, his love for you, your relationship with him, and he himself will show you what you must do and mustn't do, which is an easier way to go about it. So embrace his love today. The first way to embrace the love of God is to receive it. And you receive it by confessing it and declaring and saying, I receive your love, Lord. I see what you've done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus who died on the cross for me that I might have this relationship with you because that's the thing ultimately that Jesus did for us is he came 
to restore our relationship with God, which God had intended for us from the beginning. So if you've not given your life to Christ before, you've not made that decision to walk with him, to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, he's the source of love. And he's the one through whom we have direct access to God. So you need to receive him that you may have access to God and be able to receive and walk in all his love. So you just pray this prayer after me and then you'll be born again. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today, I receive you. I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your grace. Take my life. Do something very significant with it. May your name be glorified through me in this generation. In the name of Jesus, I pray and believe. Amen. And just like that, you're born again. That's all it takes. Imagine. Quick, easy, simple. You're born again. You're a child of God. You are beloved. God sees you just as he sees Jesus. Once you get born again, you enter the bus that's called Jesus. And so when someone looks at the bus, they see the bus. They don't know all the specific individuals in the bus. They just see the bus glorious. And everywhere the bus has access to, the people in the bus have access because of the bus that they are on. So welcome to the bus called Jesus, where some of the benefits are joy, abundance, health, healing, so many good things. You made the right decision. My eyes are so red. I need to sleep. So I'm going to end the video here. Thank you for watching. If you have made that decision, please call 0775-642-449. Please call 0775-642-449. Send a message rather and let them know that you made the decision to give your life to Jesus. You'd like to be plugged into somewhere if you don't have a church you belong to. If you do belong to a church already, just let your pastor know, your cell leader, a small group leader, someone around you who is in leadership that you can reach out to and let them know that you gave your life to Christ and they will take you on further steps from there. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day, evening, night, morning. Just be blessed always. Bye-bye. Ciao.